Hello, I'm David from Barclays. He's lying. I'm currently in the process of upgrading your account. No, he isn't. So I just need your full password. No, he doesn't. He's a scam. Once I've got that, I can send you a link to access the account. That's also a scam. Every year, millions are lost to fraud. At Barclays, we'll never ask for your full password or PIN, so never give it out. Thanks for your time. At least that's true. This is a global original podcast. Hello and welcome to Full Disclosure with me, James O'Brien, a podcast project conceived chiefly to let me spend a little bit more time with people than is ordinarily available on my radio show. And uh, when I say spend time, obviously the privations of coronavirus continue to affect us. So um, I'm delighted to be joined by Ruby Wax, albeit not in person. Ruby, thank you for doing this. Sure. Um, it occurs to me that people's idea of who Ruby Wax is is, is going to depend largely on on when they first encountered you. So, so my idea of who you are is is probably slightly different from people who've come across you since you started being so open and and honest about your own mental health issues. But I'd like to begin, if I may, at the at the very very beginning before you even arrived in Scotland to study drama. What what sort of um, pupil were you at school? What was what was family like? What was home? <laughs> I wrote a book about it, which is pretty horrific. So that would take about an hour to explain. <laughs> yeah, that would be appalling. Um, it was as it was as dark and as uh, uh, dysfunctional as you can pretty much get. I wrote a book called "How Do You Want Me," just yes. to give you an example. And Carrie Fisher was my editor, and she said my parents were almost as appalling as hers. So you can't get a better review. That's an astonishing achievement, really, isn't it? Yeah, I, mean, I worked on. They were so crazy that I could use their lines that came fresh out of their mouth and I wouldn't even have to edit them. And so getting to Scotland, getting to uh, drama school in Scotland was an escape. I know you went to Berkeley before that. Yeah, no, this was an escape because at the time, I'm in Scotland now, by the way, okay. um, Glasgow was like, I can't even explain it. It had no electricity <laughs> and the buses would turn sideways. Was, your your so, flat had no electricity. I think the city had already established something. I don't something. know, no? but it, okay. kind of, it was pretty bad. There was only uh, kind of wet coleslaw to eat. It was it was pretty depressing, except their sense of humor was so worth it that I stuck around. So I, I, the pat analysis would be that it, because childhood was a bit or a lot dysfunctional, then then you, you became... A-list. You, and therefore you sort of craved approval from, from other sources, or, or, or you became... No, a... I just needed to get away from Evanston as far as I could, and I figured my parents wouldn't get to Glasgow because they didn't know where it was, but they found it and um, came to uh, <laughs> Scud Missile me anyway. But even what, that far. why drama, though? Because I was really crap at it. You know, I there were like 3,000 people in my high school and everybody got in Hello Dolly except me. I was crap. Um, and then I decided I would be an actress. <laughs> and my parents would say, that's pathetic. Did, did you, you choose that? You, you chose the path that would most annoy them. Yeah, 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 that would upset them. And um, so I went and auditioned for Glasgow and... It was so bad, Glasgow, that nobody else wanted to go. So I I was accepted with open arms. There was a guy in my class, I hope he's not listening, who was so thick that you get different suggestions for um, audition speeches. And one was Hamlet. And so it went to be or not to be dot, 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 dot with the bear bodkin. Yeah. That was his audition. He went to be or not to be with a bear bodkin. <laughs> And he got in. But, you, I mean, there must have been a little bit more to it than, than a contrary nature, a desire to get away from Evanston and a, and a, and a, and a, a, a determination to confound your parents. You, you must have looked at drama in some sense as feeding part of your personality that nothing else could feed, or, or, or am I already...? No, no, no. I was seriously bad, and, um, <laughs> and Glasgow took me, and um, I didn't get a part. And you're paying for it, right? For yes, three of course, years. Yeah. For three years, nobody would um, give me a part. I played maid, I played snake woman, and then my f class finally complained to the uh, president or whatever, principal, that I was not getting any roles. And the class went to them. And so the last term, I got a part. 
and um, and then I got in the Royal Shakespeare Company. So screw them. Yeah, but this is what I mean. Is I mean, the, the, there's the myth, and then there's the reality. You can't have been completely useless if you waltzed straight out of drama school into the Royal Shakespeare Company. No, I didn't waltz straight out. I well, mean, I got into the Crucible first, and then I met Alan. Sure. No, sorry, I got into the RSC first. Yes. I can't remember. Well, but either, love- either way, the crucible where Alan Rickman and you struck up a, a very productive um, professional relationship and the RSC, which is something of a gold standard for people coming out of drama school. I'm not buying the idea that you were completely crap because clearly, even if you couldn't see okay, it yourself, don't buy it. other people no. must have seen something special. When I got into the RSC, people on stage with me, including Alan Rickman, mm. We're so appalled. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> they were so appalled that they would, I think they threw little <laughs> wads of balls saying maybe I should choose another career. <laughs> But even okay then, uh, drama school normally it's the other way round in that your fellow students would be delighted that you weren't getting roles because it is it's your first taste of the dog eat dog nature of the profession. Yeah. So the fact well, that they went to see the principal in your defence again means that you must have had something a little bit special to offer rather than the absolute bucket of nothingness that you're currently describing. Um, I, I think they liked me. I was always popular, mm. but Edward. Uh, what was his name? Eric Jones, who was one of the drama teacher. I'm sorry. This is the last thing I'm going to say. Sure. Saw me. It wasn't a production, but we did little scenes. And he saw me doing Importance of Being Earnest. I was playing Sicily. And he actually said, I vomited. <laughs> <laughs> Were you not yeah. tempted to return to the psychology that was the subject of your first degree at this point in proceeding? I, did, I never finished my degree. So anyway, okay. then I got in Royal Shakespeare Company. I was terrible. But Rickman said I should write the way I speak. Ah. So he taught me how to do comedy. And um, and then he, he stuck with it for 30 years. And eventually I kind of learned I would imitate him. And he said, don't look so desperate when I was doing it. And I only got that under my hat about five years ago. The, and now he would be proud. Uh, well, yes. And uh, I've heard Juliet Stevenson and others speak about Alan Rickman's role in, in building up confidence. And it's an overused word, mentor, but it, it clearly fits yeah. here perfectly. Yeah, he was more my mentor than Juliet's. <laughs> it's not <Yeah>. a competition. <laughs> it's more my, me. <laughs> it's, not yeah. a, it's not a competition. But let me just say that Juliet urinated on the stage of the Royal Shakespeare Company, and she will verify that. Fair enough. Because we were laughing a lot. Oh, well, it's, it's not hard to see why. So the the, 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 the sort of segue, you did some straight theatre work in Sheffield at the Crucible, but you realised, thanks to Alan Rickman's intervention partly, that, that your future would lie in a slightly different direction. What were the first steps on that path then? When I was in the RSC, um, I wrote a play and I cast myself as the lead and um, Rickman directed it and he put it all together. You know, I, I just vomited 200 pages and mm. he knows how to edit. And then that went to Off-Broadway in New York. And then I could really, I, I could see I could write comedy. Um, but I couldn't act it really, so he helped me. Did, did, do you have what could be called the show-off gene? Because I, I, I hope this doesn't come out wrong, but w- watching you when you were doing Louis Theroux-style programs ahead of Louis Theroux, the, 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 yeah. the, the, the ebullience that you possessed, and I, I would have marked you down as a natural show-off, but five, ten minutes into this interview, I'm thinking... You're actually not a natural show off. I, I I don't show off because no. um uh what's to show off? I mean I I don't I don't wag my tail feathers when I do comedy. I really think it's down to the lines, yes. and uh, I'm really disciplined. I wouldn't do a show where I didn't make sure every other line was what they paid for. So it's not me they're coming to, but I can do. I got some good lines. And again, presumably fame was never a, a factor in your imaginings. You, you, you don't come across as someone who was desperate to be famous, brackets, and I don't care what for, close brackets. Um, I can't tell because I just wanted to, well, I just to screw with my parents. Yeah. Because they thought I was going to be nothing. I mean, really nothing. I said, Zach, who's going to marry you? You've got a behind as big as a house. It was an encouragement. So I decided fame would be really good revenge uh, on not just my parents, but everyone that thought I was a loser. So it, fame is a very good. Um, but I was working too much on rage, and that really is not good for your health. By the time you hit 30, it could poison you. And that but probably 20, I yeah. got me far. 
Uh, yeah. uh, so a determination to avenge yourself on people who had either been mean to you or had no faith in you, starting with your mum and dad and then working right down. To everybody. It was like, yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's what I did. It's a bleak picture that you paint, isn't it? I mean, you must have had... I know you've said in the past that you married your husband, Ed, for his for his family. And, and I mean, in the context yeah. of what you've already said, that makes perfect sense. But you must have had pockets of warmth and, and, and love in your life before you got married, uh, before you met Ed by. Um, there must have been pockets of warmth. I mean, I was warmth with Alan Rickman. Yes. That was warmth and love, you know, and care. Uh, and... And in the ar- in the arms of other actors, mm. that, those are my kind of those are my tribe, you know. Zoe my, Wanamaker and yes. you know Jonathan. Pry- they were all my backup. But as you get older, and I'm still friends with them, not not Rickman, but sure. Zoe and everybody. Yes. And, um, is that I love them, but you, I kept changing my career, so I was a little bit um, rudderless, you know, as far as my community right. of people around me, because. Um, you know, it's not their fault. We all reinvent in a different direction. It doesn't mean I don't love them. It just means um, you have to keep changing the environment. You were not ultimately satisfied by writing and acting. Well, well, I mean, you went from well, acting I, to writing and then writing sort of comedy. Well, I still do. Yeah, I do comedy, but I do it on stage. Yes. Because that's my pleasure. And then... Um, and I combine neuroscience and evolution and all the stuff I learned at Oxford. I combine it with comedy. And my husband, Ed, always said he knew that would happen. But, of course, when I went to school after being thrown out of show business, uh, it was pretty desolate. And then I realized I was more interested in the brain than I was in show business. But this doesn't happen overnight. But clearly not. Why do you say you were thrown out of show business? Well, um, A, I lost my mojo. You know, right, I, yeah. I, like there's only so many. I, I lost my interest, and that shows on your face. And then B, um, other people replace me, and uh, and probably that's good because I wouldn't have reinvented. And that's a reference to the the, the kind of um, John Ronson, Louis Theroux style of documentary making, which you, I think it's fair to say, you were pioneering, weren't you, in that field? You you would spend time with famous people and get. Insights. Well, and also, I mean, I, my real pleasure was before that I did documentaries like with the Ku Klux Klan. Of and, course, um, yes, of course. And, uh, uh, you know, Alabama cl- cults that, to show that God loved them. They would throw pythons at each other. And if God really loved them, they wouldn't die. And that was my pleasure. And, and Russia during Glasnost, that was what I loved. And then they said, well, why don't you do celebrities? And I thought it was only going to be for a year. And it kept going. And then I really got disenchanted. You didn't enjoy it? Well, I made my best, you know, Carrie and some yeah. Goldie Hawn and stuff. My address book got thicker, but I'm not, uh, I was more interested in the dark side of American life and Russian, you know. I was I interested do. in documentary, not so much celebrity. Because if, if there's an abiding theme in all of your work, then it's, it, it, it's trying to work out what makes people tick. What makes people do the things that uh, they do? Yeah, that's all I want to know. It's to me, it's like a Rubik's cube, yeah. and um, and and I I try to figure it out. You know, while I'm interviewing and being funny or whatever, I'm figuring it out. You know, because I love psychology. You, I, you don't get to the nub of it. Nobody's like, you know, a paper cutout. But I try to get as to who the human is under the mask. So that's the, my plan. yes, and and I mean that that leads you, of course, to Oxford in in about twenty ten, I think, to do your masters in in mindfulness based cognitive therapy. But I, I just, if I may, I, I want to clarify a little on on this sense of it being a path you needed to be on, one that your husband, in many ways, perhaps foresaw, but also this sense of rejection that that you just alluded to. That that I mean, the idea that maybe you wouldn't have done it if. Who fell out of love with who, Ruby? Did you, did you f- fall out of love with show business? Did sh- show business fall out of love with you, or was it a sort of mutual estrangement? Well, no, I was already, I, maybe it was depression. I okay. started to lose it. You know, I had yeah. a daily show or something, and I actually had to check in an institution during, over the weekend. I really couldn't keep it up. It just maybe coincided. I had depression before, but it was always on weekends. <laughs> As in, uh, 
it wouldn't be yeah. debilitating then in, 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 no. the, in the or quotidian. holiday holiday time. And for some reason i got lucky you know it didn't get in the way and then it started getting in the way i see and uh and then that that was who knows maybe that tripped it up or um you know i do somebody, uh, uh, somebody uh, took my job somebody's going to take your job when you look sad and they do. I mean, I mean, there's insecurity in this world anyway, but, but when it's added to a sort of sense of almost a hollowness in, inside, an emptiness inside that, that you feel is being reflected on the outside, then it's a, it's a recipe for... It's time to go. Yeah. It's a, so no... Oh, really? Go on. Yeah, it's an alarm. It's, an, it's, a, it's a bell that says move on. And, I mean, where you moved on to has defined uh, the, the next chapters in your life, the next stage in your life. I think for people who, who aren't as familiar with your early work, we just I'd take a moment to, to stress the calibre and the quality of it. Script editor on um, Absolutely Fabulous, which was such a finely honed comedy. It's, I, I guess your on-screen persona for some someone who watched you a lot back in the day was a lot less... It, I wouldn't have put attention to detail on my list of things I thought about you with your on-screen persona, but with your off-screen persona, there's an incredible attention to detail. Does that sound fair, or am I barking up the wrong tree? No, I mean, I, I don't know what you mean. I, I'm sure you're right. I, attention to detail meaning I just threw myself in it without thinking. On-screen, yes, but on your yeah. script work, it's, it's, it's painstaking, I think. Yeah, but, you know, you have a chance to write and rewrite and rewrite yes. and rewrite. When you're flying by the seat of your pants, some of it's good, some of it's crap. Sure. Yeah. Did, did you enjoy yourself when you were famous for being funny? I think in my 20s it was hilarious. It was right. fun. But, yes. I mean, it was fun on high, high octane. It wasn't, uh, you know, where you could savor it or think, wow, I'm sitting back and loving this. You were just nervous that you'd never have a job again. But when I was with people, you know, who were fascinating, like O.J. Simpson and whatever, mm. I was in my element. Because you were yeah. digging into what made these remarkable people do the things yeah. that they'd done. Oh, yeah, that was interesting. It was like being a detective. Uh, uh, did becoming a mother change you? I don't think so. Um, I didn't realize I was a mother until many years later. I literally, <laughs> Jennifer and I, have Saunders, dropped, down, uh, dropped our babies while mid-flow, while yeah. we were on a show, and kept on talking. And then, um, luckily, my husband has great maternal instincts, and gradually, gradually, I, um, I must have done something right, because none of them are on crack. <laughs> and and I, I think two or possibly all three of them have followed you into the business no no two Just girls two. Yeah. are siblings and my son thank god is a coder he's in it so he'll be able to keep you all then when the, when the apocalypse comes he'll be the one that's holding up the finances for the yep. entire family yes. he'll be able to make the robots work for me he's future proof so you you get to oxford in 2010 you've got this amazing track record behind you but clearly a, a, a degree not just of depression but delusion disillusionment as well what um, what was the course like the mindfulness based cognitive therapy I, I i know what that means but i don't know yeah. what the course is like at oxford university do you spend i mean is there a lot of sessions with other students is it is it is yeah it, it's every every couple of weeks with there was only 16 people on my course and a, one of them was a genetic molecular scientist and other right. people had serious jobs and so they thought i was sort of a jerk you know it wasn't cool to be on tv at all right. and they told me that but by the end they really liked me and thought uh yeah how, she's not so stupid how, how did you end up there how did you select that course what did you i mean what did you need to know to oh, when know? i was in a, when i was in an institution i really wanted to be a i was always interested in psychology and i was so ill i thought i i would I wanted to find something where I could um, self-regulate myself, you know, rather than running to shrinks at two in the morning and say, fix me. Yes. And then you'd be enlightened, but by three in the morning, you'd forget again. So I, I researched mindfulness has the most empirical evidence, and um, so does cognitive. I didn't know that. So I thought, and so while I was in the uh, institution, Ed would pick me up. I would put my coat on over my pajamas Everybody go, boy, are you crazy, mm. which is no mean feat. I go to sit on an eight-week mindfulness course, which was a total waste of time, because um, if you haven't got a mind, what are you being mindful about? But I could see something was interesting about it. And I said, Who's the, um, who 
can tell me what happens in the brain because I don't buy anything unless I think it's physiological change. Right. And they said, uh, he's a professor at Oxford, Mark Williams. So I went to find him and I said, I'm getting in this place. <laughs> <laughs> And they were offering it. They weren't offering witchcraft. So I thought there is something to mindfulness and cognitive and neuroscience. So I studied that. And that was, you want to know, that's pleasure. That's real pleasure. Because that was my interest by then. And that's the first time perhaps you felt completely fulfilled? Yeah, probably. What, what? No, I was pretty fulfilled at different, t you know, at, at the Of course, RSC. but there's a depth of fulfillment. That, that, oh, that was that, depth. Yes. Yeah, that was, that was where the, uh, you know, you get your intelligence sharpened. And maybe I was always smart, but my parents made sure I was an idiot for 40 years. Yes. Um, they, they, and they accomplished it. But uh, then uh, I got into it and then I wrote my um, dissertation. But you have to do a practical. And that was a show which n had never been done before. So... Uh, that the people who decide if you got a master's watched a film of my show, which was pretty much about neuroscience and cognitive without the laughs. Then I got my degree, and so I, sw I spun it with comedy, and that became my first show. So I killed every bird with two stones. Uh, by knitting together the personal and the public, the, 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 the sort of private and the academic as well. Well, I only think the mind is interesting. I don't. I can't see the point of any, you know, I mean... Somebody has to know about the stars. Sure. But uh, what's more interesting than figuring out how a mind works? I can't get any, I can't think of anything more interesting. Because at the end of it, then it's not like we figure it out, but you know, everybody's screwed. And that makes me feel so much better. Because it takes well, away. Well, we have glitches. It, yeah. We have glitches. You know, evolution sure. didn't work out. It only cared about sur our survival. It really didn't give a crap about our happiness. So this has to be worked on. It, it's, we're not, um, you know, we think we're so privileged and uh, that it should come to us. But this is something uh, that for years we, we accomplished technological genius, but emotionally we're still on all fours. It's funny because it's often a, an English condition in the minds of many people. I, I don't mean that in an exceptionalist way. I just think with the history of the traditions of public school and the, and the stiff upper lip and, a, and a generations of men in particular trained almost to, to deny and abandon their own feelings, emotions being, being signs of weakness. And yet, clearly, uh, uh, under your analysis and, and in your experience, this is a universal condition. It's just perhaps different flavours of the same phenomenon that depend upon context and environment and culture yeah well and philosophers have been around you know of for course. a while and nobody figured it out until me <laughs> i don't know if the stoics would agree with you on that would they? no but i've <laughs> stolen from them <laughs> would 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 this appetite for understanding have been there if you hadn't suffered yourself if you hadn't had your own issues i don't know mark the people at oxford didn't all have depression and they were much no. smarter so I don't know. I don't think so. So it's not as if you were on a mission simply to, to, to fix or to understand yourself. There's there's an interest in the outside and the other in, in at the heart. I don't, of... still don't understand mental illness. No, I mean, of course. Nobody, yeah. Nobody knows why medication works and nobody knows where depression lurks. So I wouldn't say that helped me at all. OK. When you use the word depression, I... I... I know what you mean, um, but a lot of people don't. It's, it's, it's one of those words that perhaps gets diluted by ignorance and, and people, you know, oh, I've, my football team lost, I'm so depressed. How, how would you yeah. describe it to somebody who doesn't fully understand the um, reality of it? You know, I, I go on about it. It's a disease. I know. Yes. Yeah, it's not, it's not about, um, it's not about, well, you know, good health. It's not, you know, people say you're mentally healthy. Well, what does that mean? You're ment you're physically healthy if you're walking on all twos and have your arms. So, you know, it is a disease. It's like, uh, and it has to be acknowledged that it's there's something physiological in your brain, just the way um, you'd have uh, you'd have diabetes, and nobody gets angry when you take the insulin or ashamed. So, it is a disease. It's as it's as concrete is Alzheimer's and you wouldn't say to somebody with Alzheimer's oh come on where's the keys you remember hmm. so it isn't really respected but it's one in four so if you haven't got it just look around and so, you're going to see it somebody yeah. you love will 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 have it and and this this sort of 
I, I was trying to knit together those two thoughts. The when you mentioned physical ailments and people not having any scepticism at all about the necessity of medication in the context of diabetes or something like that, so sometimes people are when they're they're sort of telling you to buck up or pull your socks up or cheer up, come on, get out of this. They do so from a good place, but they end up providing such bad yeah, counsel. Perk up, like. Yeah, you could throw yourself off a building with yeah, perk up. Yeah, I can imagine. It's denying that. that you have something. You know, it's 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 negating your own feelings. Okay, yeah, they're they don't know that they're doing damage, but they're doing damage. But you know, just love them and ask them if they can help you. And if they if you say no, then they have to back off. Mm. Like an alcoholic, you can't drag them to AA. They have to want to be there themselves. Or they're so desperate, they say, take it over. Because, you know, you're kind of helpless when you're sick. I, I love the way that a relatively innocuous phrase in your hands becomes so so nuanced and important. When people simply say, how are you? You get quite frustrated with the pat responses, I think. With the fine, oh, great, cheers, carry on. Well, we say that anyway, just yes. to get people off our backs, you know. I don't want to really tell anybody or bore anybody so we have these moronic answers. <laughs> but then if you said, I'm, well, I now am saying, like, I, I, I've, I'm out of London now, and I was sure. telling people, I'm screwed. I'm totally frazzled, which I find refreshing. Yes. Frightening, though, for others. People don't, I mean... It, 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 well, frazzled isn't mental illness. You know, no. I run frazzled cafes at night. Yes. Uh, three times a week. And these people are not mentally ill. They're frazzled, you know, which is everybody. We're screwed because I'm saying screwed so much. We're frazzled because of the news. We're fr you know, we're frazzled because of too much comparison, too much. Um, you know, uh, now I'm wired because a whale has been beached twenty thousand miles away. What am I supposed to do? Fly there and push it back in the water? Everything is about. You know, w we need community so that other people can take the weight. And, and that's that's, that's, where, that's where I am now. Yes, that's. I mean, your frazzled cafe. Let's talk about that a little then, because this was your way of building your own community and it's 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 it migrated online -ness inevitably during during the lockdown but this was yeah. so it, it, if i see your head as a space and and your ish you, the what you don't want to happen is to have that space filled up with unhealthy thoughts frazzling thoughts thoughts uh, negative thoughts about things over which you exercise no control then community and in your case your frazzle cafe initiative that becomes a way of filling your space filling your head with better stuff healthier stuff or or, or is that yeah you know i mean uh, i i you know i wrote a the book now yes um, how, yeah which is uh and now for the good news to the yes. future with love. every single um segment of it whether it's business community health tech whatever it's all about in the future commute we have to work together or we're going to dissolve you know it's we need to have each other's backs. That's where we've gotten sick from all this isolation and individual success. You know, it's like a hand clapping. You got to work. To, we were born to mingle and isolation is the cause of mental illness and mental illness is the cause of physical, a lot of physical illnesses. So um, I, in my little way and from the book, you know, you can only do what you can, but I do give examples of the people who are really changing the world in a good way. So in my little way, yeah, when Zoom happened, we go online three times a week and you go on frazzlecafe.org and you come on either to my meeting, which is at 530, three yes. times a week, or hosts are on all day. So you can have smaller meetings just by going on that site. And there's people from every nationality every age and you look at that screen and you see the faces of people listening to you and then you feel compassion everybody yes. cares you don't think oh god he's black he's whatever if somebody resonates with you you're glued and um and so that's like my church going on frazzled and and it serves i mean i mean a purpose that many people get from actual church doesn't it because you, you, well, a, you know without the religion it's more without like the religion of course Quaker. but but, but yeah. it's an it's it's a, yes like i guess the silent time in in quaker congregations but this isn't this isn't silent this is people no. who well very loosely people who've all concluded there must be more there must be more to life than this but at the same time they've reached this kind of psychic exhaustion almost with that and we all recognize that whether we can admit Everybody it to ourselves that. or not we, where you just feel 
oh man, I, I'm just, I think there's a yeah. phrase in cars, isn't there, where they say you're running on fumes. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Yeah. You got the foot on the pedal and nothing's, you're burning your engine. Yes. <laughs> But um, everybody there says, when I say it, when I say out loud what's going on, because mm. we're not allowed to talk about the news and it's not therapy. We don't go, here's what I would do. Yes. When they say it, even for a minute, they go, oh, God, this is such relief because you see all those people nodding and going, I know. I... You know, and some people say, I've never spoken before in public, but now I feel like um, people that A, I exist and B, that people care. I mean, it's a lifesaver. Why do people find it so hard? To, I mean, why does it take something like um, uh, at Frazzle Cafe to, to, to build these bridges and, and to create these connections with people that you don't actually know outside of yeah. the meetings? I mean, you, Because you, it, people meet at cocktail parties or parties yes. and you talk about what your kids are doing, like anybody gives, you know. And it, life is hard enough, but it's such superficiality and... That just impacts, you know, you think, oh, maybe I should be more interesting. Should I be funnier? Right. How do I get people to like me that I don't even like? Uh, and I think um, people really, they, 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 you know, some people, well, from the pandemic, are locked in with their kids. Other people are locked in with nobody. Yes. Other people feel guilty because they like it. Other people, but the minute you say it, um, it's you're free. A little bit. The, the, you know? the minute you say, I feel this. I feel this. It's not free, but I always say talking is half the cure. Getting it out, uh, yeah. being honest, it, outside makes you somehow yeah, slip into it. Yeah, people love you for it. Yes, they do. They do. I, I mean, I, I've, I've had therapy in, in recent years, much to my own shock, and I've, I've written about it myself in, in, in a book that's coming out next month. But the, but the reluctance still isn't there. It takes, for someone like me, it, it takes an Ian Wright type figure. I don't know if you heard him on... Desert Island Discs talking about therapy, realizing he'd never been loved, he'd never been hugged. And the, the, the challenge is to, to remove the embarrassment or possibly the more relevant word is shame. Both of them. It's a double whammy. Mm. But, you know, I mean, shame is, I, I, that's a tricky one. We're so embarrassed about being human. And yet yes. the last book I wrote was none of us are supposed to be perfect. We're supposed to be flawed. That's that's how we're made. That's in the human package. And then I say to the audience, look at the person next to you, completely flawed. <laughs> <laughs> Underneath all the sparkle, they're a screw up just like you are. I mean, we're supposed to be glitched. You know, uh, there's so many things that evolution did well, but it's not. A, we have like this very primitive brain still, and it doesn't realize the wallpaper's changed. And yes. It just doesn't have the bandwidth to take everything that's incoming. And we have to forgive ourselves for it and not be ashamed. Nobody can take this much. What's really strange is the, uh, I mean, I, I know you've said that you'd always wanted a group of people who you could call your own. Now, if, if, I, if I read those words in isolation, and you mentioned a tribe as well when, when you got into drama, but in isolation, you'd think that the defining characteristics of the group of people you could call your own would be quite clear to see they'd be sort of external you you, you all like the same things or you all come from the same place or generational yeah, or that, ethnic it's, it's not that at all is it no i mean com real community like yes. you know is what from the heart you're connecting not from what you do for a living or you know the superficial stuff and, and it, there's a moment where that oxytocin you know this chemical comes on in you and it zips you know like uh, like a ripple effect, and there's no denying when you feel feel it, you know, yes. and you'll feel it. You'll feel it for. It depends where you are. Like I, you know, in the book, I go to Samos. I don't know these people, but boy, does it bang your heart. Well, there's a euphoria involved. I think in there's what, a euphoria. Yeah. Which again is a word that you know many people would be embarrassed to 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 employ in the sort of context of personal relations or even encounters with with relatively new people it's it's about masks then a lot of this isn't it and and not even knowing that you've got a mask on because you're so used well, to Well that's it. therapy isn't it? Yes, and it the is. therapist sits there with a chisel <laughs> and tries to remove the garbage. <laughs> you know she's like a hot colonics for your psyche. Well it, in in that context and against that backdrop I, I I you you still talk about your childhood clearly with with a lot of bitterness and 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 that one of the first things therapy does is encourage you to put an arm around your younger self and and sort of almost 
promise 10 year old Ruby that she's all right now she's safe it, it, was that part of your therapeutic experience well there you know all roads lead to Rome yes it's all a relationship and forgiving and you know it's not black and white you know I still have jerk days mm. uh, and mindfulness does the same thing a therapist does it means you're letting you're watching your own garbage but forgiving yourself for it you know we do have critical loop tapes playing in our brain and in, in my book I explain why you know that four out of five thoughts are negative yes. and again you need that because it meant you were on your toes if there was danger if you had a big smiley face you would have been eaten so we need it it's just that now it's it's got words to it rather than you know an animal goes oh, like you know it's just scared or angry or fearful but we do this thing of oh my god i'm a failure nobody else think is a failure yes. nobody likes me and that's frazzled that's a frazzled mentality and that's never happened before because of the nature of modern society and and because of the nature yeah and because of evolution why why you then why why did you take this upon yourself what what where does the sense of mission come from well i'm curious hmm. and i want to know why am i different am i a freak like i used to think i am and it turns out no i'm not this is this is how this is the this is how we're built i don't think i'm more uh, except I have a mental illness mm. that I have to deal with medication. But uh, when I see somebody, I know they've got a tape going in their head. Yes. I, I, it may be in Spanish or Mandarin, but it's still packed <laughs> with punch. The song is the same. The song <laughs> the remains song the same for, for, for everybody. And and that is where the, where the new book comes in, which is probably... I mean, I, obviously, to write a book at, at, at the, the arse end of 2020 about the good news is on one level incredibly ambitious, stroke optimistic. But this is actually, it's about the good stuff that's going on away from the spotlights and away from the media obsessions and, and away from the political. It's about people who've already recognised the importance of many of the things we've been talking about, chiefly community pulling together, uh, uh, you, you know, recognising that there are different ways of doing things, whether it's in business or, or in education or elsewhere. And, and in fact, there is quite a lot of good news out there if you know where to look. How did you work out where to look? Well, when I say good news, I don't mean some guy, you know, has painted his house pink and the whole the neighbourhood loves it. <laughs> No, I, I, finished, I finished the book the day the lockdown happened. Good so Lord. I worked three years to find... You know, where, for example, in education, there's some schools in the UK that are free, yes. where the, the kids are taught, and the disadvantaged and violent backgrounds, um, the kids are taught empathy and they're taught how to work. You know, they have a buddy so that they have a family at school and they're taught how to control, not control, but how to deal with their stress. Yes. So they know before an exam, they have breathing balls and they have charts, you know, that tell them what state you know what the weather condition is like in their minds and how to get it back down to calm and then they take the exam and the results are pretty good and they're you know they go around in a circle sometimes and say here's what i appreciate about you and um and they said that to me and i almost wept mm. you know these kids don't even know me and then the the parents build them a zen den where the kids do mindfulness and uh, it's unbelievable and then they garden and these kids didn't even know that lettuce came out of the ground, and then teach their parents how to cook. I mean, talk about changing the ge next generation. Yes. And and taught there's no such thing as a stupid question. So I would have flourished, you know. They, and they're taught, you know, think out of the box, because that's what's going to be the commodity in 20 years. There is hardly going to be a job then that exists now. So what are you training them for? How, how did you find these schools? How did you find that school? How did you find businesses um, that were... Oh, businesses... Well... Margaret Heffer, Hefferman, who's a TED Talk speaker and is yes. a genius, she put me on to B Corps, which is a, um, a an, an organization that are handing out certificates if you pass these questionnaires, like, is there fairness in your corporation? What about the supply chain? You know, is um, what are you doing for the environment? And now it's the coolest thing to get a B Corps certificate. So okay. I went to Patagonia, the sportswear company where they've been going 40 years and they make they quadrupled their profit this year where everybody in there has a a kind of um um an environmental yes. purpose 
So it's not just doing the widgets. You know, there's a purpose to their work. And they put uh, purpose in front of profit, but they still make profit. And everything, 95% is um, recycled, P.S. And then um, the way they build the buildings is the schools for their young kids are between the buildings so they mm -hmm. can look down. That You know, it's... Um, transparency, it's fairness. And when you buy something from Patagonia, they say, never buy anything from us again. If that gets damaged, send it to us and we'll fix it and then send it back. This means kids and people go, I love this company. And um, not that you can bring Patagonia to the UK, but at Unilever, Ben & Jerry's, Dove, mm -hmm. um, a, what's the other one? D Danon, a lot of companies now aren't just doing that garbage greenwashing. You know, they put a wind machine in the bathroom instead of a hand dryer, or you get a bonus because you don't flush the toilet. This is garbage. <laughs> uh, but they are, they're really walking the talk and you can look it up, you know, and, and it's, uh, you know, it's transparent. You can see what they're doing. And, um, and they're making the attempt. People roll their eyes and go, yeah, but well, there'll be an app in a second that you can check. Uh, the person that put in your zipper, did they go blind from that? Was the chicken a schizophrenic, you know, that you're buying now to eat? Sure. There will be an app in two seconds that people will be able to check. Was this person, is this person corrupt? Is this company corrupt? And that'll be in 10 years. So you better start figuring it out. So, so you have like a sort of ethical um, fact checking service that yep. will inform. But how then do you deal with the people who don't care, people who, 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 who know that they're buying stuff that's... Um, well, it'll it'll keep going, but things, you know, I did look at companies that are marginally changing, and there's such joy in working there. Now, yes. 100,000, 100 billion is lost every year in absenteeism in England. Don't you think they have to do something? Um, make your employees happy, and they'll work harder is the basic thing. And then I found tech that's really working for the good of humanity. You know, you can roll your eyes and go, my kid's going nuts from it. Sure. But no, there's somebody out there making games that teach empathy. No, for sure. Okay, it's a small amount, but everything started off small. And that's the point of the book, really, is to, is to say it is out there. It's out there and you can take little bits and apply it to your life. I'm in a community now here where I'm sitting. Mm. You can take little bits, bring it to your... And, and there is a community in southwest, South London called Bedzed, where... Again, well, not again. It's some of the housing is free. They have a community center attached to it, so that people with babies can leave it with other people. The elderly are, you know, they have classes. There's a big vegetable patch where people go in and they garden. And, and the way they built this community within London, it's uh, they have no heating bills. <laughs> oh, so, really? We, yeah, it's called Bed Z. You don't have to go there and move, but take some of these ideas and apply it to your town. You mentioned that you finished it when lockdown started. It just, just as our conversation heads towards a conclusion, it occurs to me that actually a few people, probably myself included, have made discoveries as a result of lockdown that are in some ways of a piece with, with your message, with, with what you're teaching. Because until you're compelled to do things in a completely different way from not only how you've always done them but how you presumed you would always do them and then you're compelled by something like this infernal virus to do things normal things the quotidian the daily completely differently and you realize mm. do you know what that's actually better i'm better like this I, and i'm yeah. not worrying about that so the lockdown in a sense has opened a, a new dimension on what you describe in the book despite the fact that the book was finished before the lockdown started mm. I mean, you know, at this point, we have to uh, change or, you know, what's going to happen. I don't want to do bad news. Yeah. And that is going to be through community. Otherwise, yes. if we keep this up, we're going to trash the world. Um, but I, this isn't about the bad news. This is take a look at what people are doing. And this is not like goody, goody, you know, positive things. They're actually making more money. They're making the employees happier. Yes. These kids are doing much better in school. And community is the key. And um, now I saw in small towns in the UK, they're actually having town hall meetings where they That's decide right. they're going to yes. pick up the garbage yes. and 
and do stuff. You'll feel good when you do good things. That's the that's the. No, well, it is. I mean, it, it doesn't even sound glib. It just possibly is so far away from some people's consciousness that we're not shouting it loud enough. And the Scandinavian model springs to mind a lot re- reading the book and, and listening to you today. That, that, you know, people point at Sweden and say, oh, they've got this right or they've got this wrong. But what they don't realise is that countries like Sweden and and Denmark, a lot of the Scandinavian countries have, in many ways, they're a lot further down the road that you're prescribing than we are in Britain and America. Oh, my man, Finland. I went there, Finland, you know, yes. for... Um, the, I met the Minister of Education. He said, we don't need Nobel Prize winners or heads of, you know, hedge funds. We want people to feel safe. And that country feels safe. I mean, you can have all the criticism you want, but when a refugee finally gets to Finland, they throw him straight into school. Which they, and they do. Yes. They put, you know, I had a Congolese uh, taxi driver. He said the minute he got there, they put him in school. <laughs> you know, the education rules and the teachers get more money than most jobs. I mean, they got it right. You know, my 14-year-old was saying to me last night, why, why, why don't teachers get paid a lot more? And then she told me about countries in the world where they did. And, and, and they, that, that's why Scandinavia was in my mind. Um, I, I hesitate to ask this in conclusion, Ruby, but I'm going to. How, how do you deal with cynics? How do you deal with people that, not just the obvious sort of come on, stiff up a lip type stuff, but the people who, who actually, and I'm afraid I used to be one of those people. Who, who, who so see, was I. I. Yes, well, which is an important part of your answer, I imagine. You, you, you know, the kind of, I would have seen therapy as being on a par with homeopathy or coffee enemas at one point, whereas now I think, well, personally, I think it should be compulsory. So how do you... Deal with cynics and, and, and naysayers. Well, I, you know, I haven't yet since the book came out. Um, you can't argue with what I show you. No, that's very true. <laughs> it's not a fantasy. There is, you know, go. I give you phone number. Go look up this yes. tech. Yes. Go look up this business. So how can you be a cynic? You could say, I don't want to do this. Uh, that's your business. But if you get if you're laying down the uh, uh the location i mean i'm in an eco community now okay. that's where i go to so the book did change my life i'm not moving here but i'm here for the month wow and in a week i'm going off grid because i got to clear my brain sure because i that book sucked it out of me but i can see only the pr when i met those people i could have gone on for 10 years <laughs> so it's i mean it's 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 be the change you want to see really then isn't it I mean, uh, yeah, I wanted to walk the talk when I did that book. I'm still, you know, I'm still got the terrible recordings in my head. Like when I get off, I'll think, what was I talking about? But um, when I get off, I'm work literally in two minutes. I'm working in a vegetable garden and the, the stuff I'm picking goes to a um, food bank. I'm not saying bully for me, but I'll be happy in the next hour. In London, I might not have been. I, and I, I will detain you no longer. Um, I, I shall let you get off to your vegetable patch. Ruby Wax. Thank but, no, thank you so much indeed. And now for the good news, to the future with love. And in some ways, the subheading is 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 almost more descriptive of the book than the than the first line of the title, isn't it? To the, to the future with love is... <laughs> is out now in, in hardback. Thank you so much, Ruby. Thank you. I really like this. That was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.